Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and it is our last Friday of the month. And you know what that means. We sit down with someone and talk politics. Not that we don't do that throughout the entire month, but we bring on someone to talk uh, provincial politics, leadership races. And today I am pleased and honored to have the author of the writ, Eric Grenier. Eric, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, Eric, before we get started, I want to ask the age-old question that I've asked every single pundit, political author, uh, people who watch politics. What's so fascinating to politics to you? I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, because the way I got into following politics, I think it's primarily through the history of it. Um, and one of the things that actually, I know it's a weird thing to say, but that was a big introduction for me was the the election maps. I just loved going over maps and looking at the results from uh, previous elections. So I think that was a bit of the entry for me. I was always fascinated by maps and charts and things like that. And so for me, politics is more about uh, the elections. That's what I find interesting. Now, obviously, the policy and the governing is the most important thing. Uh, but in terms of my own interest, it's always been about elections and campaigns. I just find them very fascinating. Uh, when people are forced to make their, those choices, what happens, the characters involved in them. And uh, I, I, that's the part of politics that I find most interesting. Now, I, I kind of agree with you because I enjoy elections as well. And I can remember my first election, that 1990 uh, Ontario election with Bob Ray being elected. The only reason that is, is because my aunt was a candidate for the Ontario Liberals in that election in Durham East. Um, Do you remember your first election? Do you remember that first moment when you were able to watch and go, this is potentially something I want to get involved in or talk about? The first election I think that I remember, um, and maybe I'm going to be uh, dating myself, but I do remember the 95 referendum. I remember my parents were watching that. By then we had we had moved out of Quebec. We moved into Ontario. Um, so, you know, we had still a lot of family in Quebec. So I remember watching that and understanding that that was an important moment, that it was very close. Um, but in terms of an election that uh, really got me more interested in, in terms of me getting involved in it and in getting interested in actually following politics. I think it was around the, the first minority governments that we had recently, the 2004, 2006 elections, when we were getting much more competitive in terms of its politics. I remember the 2000 election, but um, I wasn't uh, even in university yet, so I wasn't really following it that closely. Uh, but I remember 2004, 2006, those series of elections, which is probably why I got so interested in it, that we had elections after election um, in 2004, 2006, 2008. Uh, so I think that was probably the time when I got really keyed in on it. So we we have a lot to discuss over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how much time you can. You like to talk about elections and uh, leadership races. But I want to start with the biggest election that's happening across Canada right now. Well, it's not officially happening yet, but it seems like because all the candidates are opening up their campaign headquarters, they've got their signs, they're asking for donations, and that's Ontario's general election. They are going to the polls on June 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. You'll probably correct me if I'm wrong there. It's either June right. 2nd or oh, June 2nd. I was going to say June 3rd, but it's, it's June 2nd. Um, Doug Ford is leading in the polls. You have a split left in the province with the NDP and the Liberals. Uh, Your first impressions heading into the official writ period. Ah, So what, what would you think is the biggest obstacle that Doug Ford has to overcome in the next four weeks if the writ isn't dropped by this time of airing? I think that for Doug Ford, it's to not mess up. I think it's as easy as that, because I think for the PCs, they are on track to win the election. And all the polls have been putting them now in the lead and have started to give them more of a lead than they had maybe at the beginning of the year. And while their support has come down a little bit from where they were um, in 2018, the other parties are further back. So the gap between them is even wider, gives them more margin for maneuver. And I think that The Liberals and the New Democrats, they haven't yet been able to differentiate themselves enough that one of them is able to break from the pack of being in the mid 20s, mid uh, high 30s. So for the PCs, I think it's just to make sure that nothing upsets this, that um, they aren't dogged by 
big questions on the campaign trail. For example, if the pandemic got worse in the midst of it, that could be the kind of thing that could uh, bring up questions about why the government did this or that or opened up too soon, that kind of thing. Um, but otherwise, I think if they can manage to just keep smooth sailing, keep the, uh, you know, the, the, the normal kind of shenanigans you see on a campaign trail to a minimum, uh, that they might be able to pull this off because I, I do have some doubts about uh, the ability of both Andrea Horvath and Stephen Del Duca to really rise up to be a change agent because I'm not sure based on what I've seen in polls that there's a real desire for change in Ontario and without that it's hard for one of the opposition parties to um, to present themselves as an alternative that people are going to get behind. And we'll talk about the Ontario Liberals and the Ontario NDP here in a few seconds, but I want to stick on Doug Ford. Well, we traditionally talk about, uh, what, especially here on my show and you, you on the writ, you talk about uh, the PCs, the Liberals, but Doug Ford is an entity on it himself. He is the PC party because we all remember Tim Hudak. We remember Ernie Eves. We, for those who actually followed politics in the 90s, Mike Harris. But this isn't the Ontario PC party. This is the Doug Ford PC party. And my, uh, my best guess, is Doug Ford still popular? Because we all remember his brother. He's as kind of his own man now. Is Doug Ford still as popular as he was when he was first elected in 2018? I'd say that he's about the same, and he wasn't that popular when he came in. Um, I think that he you was able so? to win. Be well, if you look at where the polls were at 2018, uh, just around the election, maybe the month after, his approval rating was somewhere around 40%. It sort of matched how much of the vote um, that the PCs got. What often you see when you have a new premier coming in is that they have an approval rating somewhere around 40 but he, they're not that well known, so their disapproval rating might be 20 or 30%. People are still getting to know him. The thing with Ford was that everybody had an opinion about him, and most people didn't like him, right? His disapproval rating was usually in the 50, high 50s, or around 60%. Um, so that really hasn't changed. There's still a lot of people who really dislike him. And I think that probably there's more people that dislike him more, let's say, <laughs> that intensity of dislike has grown. But there still is, based on the latest polls, around 35 to 40 percent of people who approve of him. And if you can manage that, then you can win an election. So I, I think he still is. Uh, he, he, he wasn't much of an asset, I'll say it this way, in 2018. Uh, I think he was more that people were wondering whether he was going to mess up during the campaign. He was going to screw something up. But I think now he is a bit more of an asset. I think that the pandemic actually made him seem more human, more uh, relatable. And I think that has helped him uh, quite a bit. I, I want to talk about Andrea Horvath. This will be her fourth election as Ontario NDP leader. Um, the polls, as you say, have the Ontario Liberals and the Ontario NDP neck and neck. They can, they, every poll I watch, it's either the NDP ahead by two points, the Liberals ahead by two points, or vice versa, flip flopping the entire time. Um, because she is a known quantity, should she not be doing better than what she's doing right now? Or are people still, and I, again, I talk about the 1990 election. People are still upset about that 1990 election and Ray Days. And is she still carrying baggage from that 90 to 95? Uh, tenure of the Ontario NDP, or has she be, been able to break away from that history? Uh, it's hard for me to say because I don't, I can't get into people's heads. My my <laughs> view would be sure. that <laughs> after what has it been three decades that when people think of NDP, they might not think of Bob Ray, right? They have so many other examples now of NDP. Uh, you know, whether it be federal parties or provincial parties, past leaders. Um, so I, I would say that they've gotten away from that because I think that, you know, when you think of the NDP in the 1990s, they were pretty popular actually in a lot of places in the country. Um, and in many of those places, they've been able to win elections since and they've had some support in federal elections. So I think that she has distanced herself away from that a little bit. But for Andrew Horvath, I think the issue is that um, she's never really had very strong personal numbers. Uh, they've always been pretty good or, you know, she has about as many people who approve as disapprove of her. Um, but in Ontario, I don't think that a lot of people pay attention very much to provincial politics. So I, I would wager if you asked people who is the opposition leader in Ontario, no one would, not no one, but not a very long, big amount of people would say Andrew Horvath. 
they might be like, uh, someone I can't remember. And then you just show out a picture that like, uh, I kind of remember who that is. In Ontario, I just don't find that provincial politics is very top of mind. So every time there's an election, I feel that for Andrew Horvath, she has to reintroduce herself to a lot of Ontarians and, and people have been, oh yeah, I remember her. And, you know, is, then they have to- Is that a blessing and a about. curse? Is that a blessing but, and a curse that you have to reintroduce yourself? Because you might not like the policies from our 2018 election. So we're going to reintroduce our brand new policies that you don't remember from the 2018 election. It would be better if she was very well known and very well liked, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But it does give her a bit of a chance that every time she can kind of try something a little bit different. Um, I think back in 2014, you know, the Ontario NDP was trying to be the much more a uh, responsible party, try, you know, form a government kind of party, and in 2018 maybe as well. Um, but if they wanted to try to be a little bit more to the left, then I think they could do that. A lot of people wouldn't really remember too much what Andrew Horvath and the NDP were offering in previous elections. One of the new, I would say new kids on the block, but there's a lot of new parties in this new election that we'll probably chat about here in a few seconds. But the one of the main leaders on the block is Stephen Del Duca, former transportation minister under Kathleen Wynne. If I, I'm, I'm trying to think if he was part of the McGinty, but I think he just got elected and he wasn't in cabinet under McGinty, was he? I don't know. You got me. Ah, dang it. Which is a bad sign. It's a bad sign that I can't remember. (laughs) Exactly. It's a bad sign that I can't remember. And I worked at Queens Park for a while. (laughs) So um, Stephen Del Duca is trying to introduce himself. He is still carrying the baggage and the uh, two opposition part of the two other parties, the NDP and the PCs, are trying to paint him as win 2.0. As a third party, this is very unusual for a a third party to get this much attention from the opposition leader and the premier. Why is that? Are the liberals seen as a threat to both parties right now, or are they just giving Stephen Del Duca air oxygen, which they shouldn't be? I I think they do see them as a threat um, because the liberals have been up in the polls. If you you know, they're the only party that has actually made any gains. A lot of that, I, I have some, you know, doubts about how much of it is the liberal brand people are thinking of that they just voted, you know, they voted for Trudeau twice um, since the 2018 election. Um, So there might be a little bit of a a factor there. But I think that definitely both parties need to be aware of the liberals, because if the liberals do get their support back to traditional levels, because if you think about 2018, it was a very anomalous kind of election for them. That means the PCs have to worry about losing seats to the Liberals in the GTA, and the NDP has to worry about losing seats to the Liberals in Toronto and some other urban centres. So I, I think that there is good reason for them to make sure that they can keep the Liberal vote down, because if the Liberal vote goes up, it's bad news for both of them. And so it, it is a bit unusual that they have to worry about a third place uh, party leader, but I think it might be a sign that the PCs in the NDP don't think they have that many votes that are that they're contesting between them, that it's more uh, the liberals are standing between them. What's Del Duca's biggest obstacle that he has to overcome? Because I, I, I was speaking to my family over the Easter weekend and I asked them, like, are you thinking about the election? And the first thing they said is, well, we like Doug Ford because they gave us a rebate check. Like you said, they didn't know who Andrew Horvath was and they really couldn't tell me who the liberal leader was because they didn't think they had one because all they can remember is Kathleen Wynne. Is that their big, his biggest obstacle is actually to introduce himself because COVID-19 has locked everything down and he hasn't really been able to do a leaders tour across the province of Ontario. And how does he overcome that within four weeks? <laughs> yeah, I think the issue is for him, not so much that he's not well known, it's that if he doesn't make a good first impression, because if he was some other party, they'd be like, well, who is this guy? And I don't even know what this party stands for, but it's a liberal party. So people already have a view of what the liberals are. And, and so as long as Stephen Del Duca comes for, uh, comes forward in the first debate, for example, and puts a good impression in people's minds and be like, okay, I remember the Liberal Party and this guy seems okay, then they'll be fine. But if he doesn't come off well, then I think then it could be really dangerous for the Liberals that a lot of people will just sort of write the party off and be like, oh, okay, Liberals are again, not a factor here. It's time to go over to the NDP or to the PCs if, if, if uh, people were you know, more to the center. But uh, I think that's the biggest obstacle that when you're not known, it's an opportunity, but it's also a big risk because people might not like you and you don't you won't have time to change people's minds. 
We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. So is the liberal support soft right now? Is that what you're kind of alluding to? Is that it's there, but it could flip on a dime within like, we talk about those swing voters in the federal election with the NDP. Okay, we see the uh, conservatives are going to win in some seats, so we're going to go over to the liberals and vice versa. Is that what is that what is happening with the liberals right now in Ontario? Yeah, I think so, because they've gained maybe around 10 points. And there's not a huge reason to explain that, right? There's maybe a few policies that come out with recently, but um, there's not a huge reason to explain why the party would be up that much. So they have to make sure they can keep that. And if people don't like what they see when they delve a little bit more deeply, then they'll probably end up going back to whatever they did last time and who they voted for last time. So I think that they are probably the softest vote out of the three major parties because the NDP, you know, a good chunk of their vote you know, 20% of the whole electorate probably is going to vote NDP either way, but it's all about that extra little vote. And they don't seem to have right now much more than their base support, right, that they've had over the last couple of elections before 2018. So I think for the Liberals, it is for them the biggest, uh, the biggest risk that they lose a lot of their votes. Sort of a newcomer to the provincial atmosphere in Ontario is the Green Party. They first got elected in 2018 in the riding of Guelph. For their leader, Mike Schreiner, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, was first elected. He is now going to be a force on the debate stage. He was trying to get in in the last election. He wasn't able to, but now he's able to. Um, does this give them a chance to potentially keep that one seat of Guelph and expand, or is it going to be hard for them to break out of that one seat mold? I think that they are probably in a good spot to retain their one seat because Schreiner won with a really big margin of the vote, much more than he needed. It was almost like there was a strategic vote that overcompensated. Um, and, but, and I think he's gotten a lot of attention, uh, more than a Green Party leader would elsewhere. So I think that he, he, holding Guelph is probably something he can do. But it's all about whether they can get a second seat. So I think that'll be a bit of a challenge for them. You know, the federal Greens did win Kitchener Center, and that's a place where the Green Party has some, you know, a little bit more strength than in other areas. So if um, Schreiner can convince the people who voted in Kitchener Center just a couple months ago, Green to do it again, then they can win a second seat. But beyond that, I think it's going to be a little bit tough because uh, it doesn't feel like the kind of election where the Greens are going to just rise up. And Schreiner, while he is not very well known, he has been around for quite a while. He's been a leader almost as long as uh, Andrew Horvath has. Um, so it's not like a new dynamic party is going to come in and, and uh, sweep away the other two. So I think for the Greens, it is you know, still small ball for them. They're trying to find that extra seat or two if they can. And being at the debate, that that's pretty big for him. The uh, the ridings in Ontario, they match up like completely with the federal ridings, right? It's like uh, verbatim one for one. Like there's no yeah, outside of outside of the north. There's a couple extra seats in the north. That's right. I do apologize. Kenora is one of them that split into two last election, right? Um Doug Ford has the Liberals to worry about, but he also has the rise of two semi-new parties, the New Blue and the Ontario First Party. If I'm, I think it's Ontario First or Ontario Party, led by Derek Sloan, the former member of Parliament. Um, so he's going to be attacked on his right flank, and he's going to be attacked on his left flank, and he's going to be stuck in between. Does Doug Ford have to worry about these two new parties, or are they? one-off election parties? I'm not sure, um, because you would think that they would follow them the same path as Max and Bernie did in the federal election, but I'm not sure if they still have the same energy right now with the issue of vaccination and, and pandemic uh, restrictions, because there's not really that many in place anymore. Um, so we'll see. There might be a couple seats where they could be uh, enough of a problem that they can split the vote. Uh, but if they do follow the same pattern as, as Bernier's party, um, you know, they were taking a lot of votes from the Conservatives, but probably taking even more from non-voters. So these are people who weren't going to vote anyway. 
So it's not a vote that would have went to Doug Ford. But I do think in a couple ridings after we're done at the election, we might see that, you know, the party took three, four, five percent and the PC is lost by one or two. And you could easily make the argument that uh, that made all the difference. But, uh, you know, it is a thing because I, I there it, the election in 1990, for example, was one where the uh, the PCs were really hurt by the family coalition and some other smaller parties that were taking votes off the table. So this can play a, a factor. I'm not sure if it's a big enough factor here because if the PCs are, are ahead in the polls on election day by 10 points, you know, it's not going to matter. But if it ends up being close, then yeah, those votes will probably make a big difference. We, we always talk about the, uh, the the late surprise in elections, whether it be a debate issue, whether it be the gun issue in the federal election, it can swing. You talked about COVID-19 a little bit beforehand, and it, are we going to see an official rise of the sixth wave? Are we going to see potential lockdowns being introduced during the election? How? Because Doug Ford can call the election tomorrow if he wants to. He can drop the writ, he can issue the writs tomorrow, and we can go. But he's waiting, I think, for as long as possible because he wants to see if something is going to happen. What are you looking for in this election for that October surprise, as we used to, I, I used to call it, but that surprise that could potentially come out of nowhere? Is there anything that you're potentially looking at, is, or is it just COVID? I think that that is probably the biggest uh, Achilles heel for the, the PCs. There has been some indications over the last couple of days that maybe the wave is cresting in Ontario, which might be very good news for the PCs um, if that holds. But who knows what's going to happen in another you know month? Um, I think that might be a big risk because I think a lot of people have moved on from uh, from the pandemic, and I think that they've moved on from being angry at the government about it. If this election had taken place at various times during the pandemic, in the early days, Ford was like everybody else, big surge in the polls. But there's a couple of moments during, during the pandemic when the government flip-flopped on certain issues. There was a time when they were closing parks for children and people were very upset about that. If the, if the election had taken place in those moments, then the pandemic would have been the ballot box issue and the PCs would have lost. Now, I think uh, people are just kind of thinking about other things. And so the pandemic's not a big issue. If though there is a big rise in hospitalizations and uh, the government's not acting or people are starting to get really worried, then it might bring up those memories of, oh yeah, there was a few moments during this pandemic when the Ford PCs weren't doing a very good job. And I think that's the biggest risk because um, if people are just thinking about the economy and things like that, then the PCs will do pretty well. What is the ballot box issue as of right now? Is it the post recovery of the pandemic? I know it's going to be different and we're not going to officially know it until probably about two weeks into the election. But if you were a betting man, what would you say is the ballot box issue right now for the three, four leaders to potentially start pitching their votes on? Because I'm watching these rallies that Andrew Horvath, Doug Ford and uh, Stephen Del Duca, uh, Del Duca, Del Duca is uh, giving and they're all over the place. It seems like they're all they all, all got different messages and there's no consistent message of what the ballot box issue and everyone wants to try to define the election. It's just nothing's sticking right now. What do you think is the actual going to be if COVID isn't going to be that ballot box issue? I'm not sure if there will be one in this case. I think in some Ontario elections, it's, there's a very clear issue. You know, if you think about when uh, John Tory was proposing um, uh, getting the faith-based schools funded from the provincial government, um, you know, then that becomes a big issue. Uh, there was the jobs plan that Tim Hudak had, that became the big issue. In this one, it feels like we're just kind of, the election's scheduled, so we're gonna have it. Uh, that's kind of how it seems to be going at this stage. In terms of like, what is people's biggest issue right now, it does seem to be affordability to housing. I don't know though, if, if the election is gonna turn on those things, because everybody's gonna be saying what they're gonna do for those. Uh, so it kind of might all go out in the wash. I always tend to think that elections are decided on trust. That is always what I think is most important. And I think it'll be whether Ontarians trust Doug Ford to govern the province for another four years, or they think that they can't trust him, and can they trust someone else? I think it tends to come down to that. And while we think about specific policy issues as being really dis decisive in it, I think in the back of everyone's mind is just whether I trust um, this man or woman to actually make the good decisions for the next four years. Second last question on the Ontario election before we move on to the leadership races, and that is, I have never seen a higher percent of sitting MPPs resigning 
than I have in this election. I think the last count that I had was 14 or 15 MPPs from all parties, except the Greens, uh, from, well, independents, uh, liberals, NDP, and conservatives, all taking stock and leaving. Um, that usually tells me one thing, either they don't have faith that their party is going to win or that they see the writing on the wall and some actually just do want to retire. What's your indication on what's happening with Ontario politicians right now? Are they just getting out because they've had their time and they want to just move on? Or is this something bigger that we should be looking into? Yeah, it's unusual because it's just a first term government, right? So it's yeah. not that people have been sitting in government for eight, 12 years. I think there's two different factors. One is specific to Ontario in that um, maybe when people had signed on to run in 2018, they were signing on to run in the Patrick Brown PC party. Suddenly it's the Doug Ford party and all right, let's see how that goes. And some of them might not have enjoyed being in Doug Ford's PC uh, party. I think the other factor though, and I, I'm not sure, it'd be interesting actually you should probably look at the numbers, but I just wonder if the pandemic has made people overly exhausted, overly wanting change, re-questioning what they want in their lives. And for a lot of people, the last four years, if you have been in government or in opposition, it's probably been a really long four years and maybe you're not up for it again. So I wonder if that is a big factor here, because I think we have seen a, quite a few incumbents that aren't running again. In the federal election, there was, there was a bunch. Um, there's some in the Quebec election that's coming up. So I wonder if that's a big factor here, that people are just tired and want a break like everybody else, I guess. The, the only one that I'm not surprised at is Kathleen Wynne. She held on for four years because the liberals were that's surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Without that she held on. She, yeah. Surprise, surprise. She actually did hold on for the four years. Um, I want to turn keep on the Ontario politics, but I want to go federally here for a second. Doug Ford was a non-existent factor in the uh, federal election in 2021 uh just like he was in 2019 he seemed to have just disappeared and he was doing his own thing with a leadership race going on for the conservatives with the amount of pull that pierre polyver is getting across the country does doug ford tap all the leadership candidates on the shoulder the conservatives and say come to ontario let's shore up the base so that way in three years time when we actually have a federal election we can throw our support behind you? Or does he say to the leadership candidates, stay out like you told me to stay out of the last federal election? Yeah, I think there might <laughs> be a bit more of that, right? Because in 2019, uh, I, I remember that there was conservatives saying that Doug Ford was hurting them in, in the GTA and in Toronto. Um, and so he was told to kept, uh, keep out. And I don't think they liked it that very much. In 2021, I think he decided he was going to stay out because he was getting along pretty well with Trudeau. And, you know, he always talks about Christy Freeland as how, how great friends they are. So if I'm Doug Ford, um, you know, I have to say, he might be hoping that whoever becomes a leader also fails. I'm not, you know, he's always talked about, or at least people have talked about, that the Fords have, have dreamed of becoming prime minister. Uh, Doug Ford probably would prefer if the Conservatives lose the next federal election and there's a vacancy there that he could step into. So I don't know. I don't. I, he has given orders to his MPPs not to endorse anybody, doesn't want to get involved. So maybe he's going to stay that way. Even Robin, Roman Babar, Babar? Like I don't think he wants him. He probably doesn't want him. The former in, former PC turned independent. Um, but let's jump on to the uh, Conservative leadership race here for a few minutes. And um, I, I'm out here in Alberta, and you can imagine that is conservative country. So when a conservative leadership candidate comes, people show up, unless you're John Charest, which only 15 people showed up. Um, what's your thoughts on how it's going back in Eastern Canada? Because I've only seen the Western numbers, and I see the poll that Pierre is getting. I see the poll that Leslie Lewis is getting. Patrick Brown seems to be a sleeper agent in this election. He seems to not be canvassing, campaigning in the traditional sense. And uh, I have not seen Roman out in Alberta, so I don't know. But how is it going in Ontario? Because Ontario, Quebec are the two major provinces that the Conservatives need to do well in the next election. Is Pierre doing well? Is John Charest playing well in Ontario and Quebec as well? I, it's hard to say because it, uh, Poiliev has been doing his road trip out in Western Canada, it seems. So we haven't seen what kind of crowds he can attract in Ontario, at least up to now. 
but I would suggest that he would be pretty popular in Ontario. He is an Ontario MP. He represents a riding just outside of Ottawa and or in the Ottawa suburbs. And he has a lot of support, I think, from that kind of uh, Ontario PC, Ontario Tory. Uh, he has a lot of history with the party locally in rural parts of Ontario. It's just, you know, which is his riding is sort of a split between urban and suburban. Um, you know, he would be very popular in rural Ontario, and there's a lot of seats that the uh, Conservatives um, have members there. So for him, I think that Ontario is a place where he's going to do pretty well, but maybe not as well as Western Canada, because I think he is contesting a lot of uh, the memberships with Patrick Brown in the GTA uh, in particular, where Patrick Brown is putting in a lot of efforts to sign people up. And for Jean Charest, uh, you know, he says that he's doubled the number of members in Quebec. And if he does, that's really good news for him because there's not that many members in Quebec. So if he can get it from 10,000 to 20,000 and 10,000 of those are his, then he's going to be winning a lot of points in, in, in Quebec. But I don't think that Joe Charest is necessarily um, running away with Quebec because he does have a lot of opposition in Quebec. The, the Charest years were pretty contentious years in, in Quebec politics. Um, so it's not a given that he's doing really well there. And Poliev, while he's not... He might not seem like Quebec's cup of tea. Um, he is very similar to Eric Duhem, who's the leader of the Quebec Conservatives, a provincial party that has been rising in the polls much more to the right than even the federal Conservatives, much more the kind of language we hear from Poliev. So he would have uh, a clientele there. And, and then in Atlantic Canada, that's where I think that Charest is probably pretty strong. Uh, that's where he's going to get the old PC vote. Uh, when Charest ran the PCs back in 1997, the party did really well in Atlantic Canada. Uh, so I think that that part of the uh, country is probably pretty friendly for Jean Charest. Um, but he probably needs to be doing a lot better than Quebec, even than he is what he's saying if he's going to win, because uh, of just how well Polia is probably going to do in Western, uh, Western Canada and in parts of Ontario. Now, you should never believe what you read on social media, because let's be honest, some people can just put out random things and it's true uh, or it's not true. Um, but the moment Aaron O'Toole was forced out of leader, the conversation started about the soul of the party, the future of the party. And you, in, in the 2020 leadership race, you saw the two center candidates, Aaron O'Toole, as much as he tried to play himself off as a uh, like more right wing candidate, uh, I know Aaron O'Toole. I was the first, one of the first can, uh, inter, uh, journalists to interview him when he ran in the by-election after Bev Oda resigned. So I, I, I know the O'Toole's quite well. I'm from Durham. And then you had Peter McKay. And then you had Derek Sloan and Leslie Lewis. This election, this leadership race, you were seeing more of that traditionally right-wing part of the party start announcing their intentions to run. Mark Dalton, you're seeing a few, Roman Baber, uh, I'm not sure where he would sit on the spectrum, but I'm assuming he's not a true PCer. He would probably be a little bit more right-wing and more of the, a little bit more right of Pierre. And then Pierre uh, and then Leslie Lewis. Are we seeing the rise of the Conservative Party from a more right-wing perspective now than the traditional centrist party that it was potentially under Stephen Harper? I'd say that the party has been moving to the right for quite a while. Um, and I, I'd say that also with O'Toole in 2020, while he was a centrist candidate in 2017, and he might have deep down inside been a centrist, he posed as the right wing candidate in 2020, right? So I think that for the people who are supporting Poliev now, who are already members, because he might be bringing in lots of other people too. But they voted for Aaron O'Toole thinking they were getting someone like Pierre Poliev. And I think now they're much more enthusiastic that they get, they're get they getting someone that they can actually, that they might believe is much more what he's um, coming off as. Because Poliev is pretty authentic in who he is. That is who he is. It's, it's the kind of politician he's always been. So, uh, So I think that the party has been moving to the right. And I think that the membership has long been there. And I think that what we're seeing here is that Poliev is much more effective at tapping into where the Conservative Party is now. And I think that Peter McKay and Jean Charest uh, were tapping into what the party might have been once. Uh, I think this is much more of the, the, um, the more populist side of the party that is, that is taking hold of, of the membership and the old red Tory um, you know, establishment kind of conservatives are getting fewer and fewer. And for Jean Charest, he's hoping that there'll be some 
people from outside of the Conservative Party who want it to be like that again, who will join and and back him. But uh, I think Polyev is being very effective at tapping into where the membership actually is now. Because I think if their vote was right today, he, he'd win it easily on the first ballot. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. Now, I, I, I'm all about history. I like looking at numbers. I like looking at where people have voted beforehand. In 2017, and 2020, the leadership races, both candidates who had the most endorsements from the caucus went on to lose. Peter McKay had the most, and then if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Maxine Bernier or even Aaron O'Toole. It was O'Toole, the, actually. O'Toole yeah. had the most in 2017. Is, is this a curse that's going to happen again? Or like you said, it's Pierre's to lose, basically, because he is tapping into something much more uh, needed than just a caucus endorsement. Because I don't think caucus endorsements mean anything. That's my own personal opinion. I think people look at the person and look at the, uh, the policies. But do you think that caucus endorsements matter at the end of the day in this type of an election with a strong front runner? They matter. Uh, for me, endorsements are one of two things. All right. So the first is um, people who are endorsing a candidate and they're going to help out. And some endorsements matter because they are well-known people and they have good organizational skills and they're going to put some effort into the party. When I looked at the numbers back in 2017, the average endorsement made a difference of about 10 points in a riding. So there were some who really delivered the writings, particularly in Quebec, there was a couple of them. And then there's others that, you know, the candidate actually did worse in the writing where they had the endorsement than in some writings where they didn't. But overall, I think that they help a teeny bit. But I think what they're much more important is that they are a sign for the rest of us of uh, who people think is going to win. So people right now think Poilievre is going to win and they want to get behind him. And, you know, conservative MPs are presumably much more tied into what the membership thinks than you know, you or me. And so that kind of, that means something to me, but you're right. In 2017, O'Toole had a lot of um, endorsements and he finished third, you know, in 2020, it was McKay. And I think a lot of people thought that he was just the, the, the uh, juggernaut and he was going to win. And so they got on board. But I wonder if with Poliev doing so well now with endorsements, it's a sign that one, they think he's going to win, two, they want him to win, but also that the party is much, the who's left in the party, who are MPs in the party, are much more of the Poilievre type than the old O'Toole or McKay type from the previous election. So I wonder if it, it's a sign of the transformation of the party, because it is pretty remarkable that he's got, gathered so many endorsements so quick, whereas Jean Charest, who is second in endorsements, is way behind. And he's hardly ahead of Leslie Lewis, I think. So it, it does show that the party is, is getting behind Poilievre. But you know, is our do do members look at oh well, that person endorsed so then I'm going to get on board? No, I don't think that's what people do. Well, I just say that because I think a lot of people, especially here in Calgary, took a were taken back by Michelle Rempel Gardner's non endorsement of Pierre and throwing her weight fully behind Patrick Brown. And I think a lot of people went, whoa, what's going on here? And I, that's one of the first endorsements that she's given in the last two elections. And let's be honest, Pierre never endorsed uh, O'Toole or McKay or anyone during the 2017 election. So he stayed, he kept his nose clean out of those two elections. Do major players like those uh, Ed Fast who endorsed Josh Ray, uh, the uh, Michelle Rempel Gardners who endorsed Patrick Brown hold sway in Eastern Canada? Like, do people look in Eastern Canada and go, oh, Michelle Rempel didn't do that? Because outside of Calgary, I, I'm in a bubble here, so I don't know how it's playing out in uh, Ontario or Toronto. I think someone like Michelle Rempel Garner probably does, because I think that she has a big following on social media. She is often on, on uh, panels and that kind of thing. And I think that she is one of the the higher profile MPs in the caucus. So I think for her, she is someone who conservative members in Halifax and Toronto would recognize. Someone like Ed Fast, who might have a lot of appeal, uh, you know, in the Lower Mainland, probably not known outside of that. So there, there are a couple figures who I think have risen above, um, you know, just sort of the generic knowledge of politics. And she would be one of them. The fact that she did get behind Brown, I think was 
uh, was one of the endorsements that probably matters because I think that it's one where it gives a signal to other people that, oh, okay, he is a serious candidate because I like Rebel Garner and she likes him. So maybe I'll give him a second look. So I think that's one of those that matters, but the average one, probably not, you know, if, if they're known locally, maybe it makes a bit, a bit of a difference within the membership. But, um, you know, if you're signing up other members, then the local MP might not be known very much to the new people who are signing up for the party. Like a Dean Allison endorsing Leslie Lewis. Like it doesn't make any play out here. And I guarantee you not a lot of people know who Dean Allison is or which riding he represents. Niagara Falls for anyone right. who's paying attention. Um, while we are talking about leadership races, there is another one not officially started. But it is going to be starting here soon because under party constitution, it has to start before May. And that is the Green Party of Canada. Uh, we have some candidates or some alleged candidates who have put their name forward. Uh, they haven't really made a splash because under the party constitution, you can't actually campaign until a uh, leadership race is actually called. The Greens are in disarray right now, and I think a lot of provincial uh, Greens here in Alberta have said that to me off the record. What do the Greens need to do to get back to their mojo of when Elizabeth May was leader in 2015, when they had that breakthrough of three seats? I know that's a, not a lot, but three seats for a fourth party is quite a large number. I don't know. I, I, I if I was uh, someone, a strategist within the Green Party, I'd be, I, I'd be a little worried about what's going to come uh, next for the party because they, what's their, what's their reason, right? Like the Greens, Elizabeth May would always say that they weren't just an environmentalist party; they cared about this or that. But for most Canadians, it's an environmentalist party. Let's be clear. If the other parties, the Liberals and the New Democrats, are coming forward with decent environmental policies, they're taken for, uh, they're taken seriously on them. They, it does squeeze the greens out. So I think that is an issue for them. They need to figure out where they fit into this system because right now, why would you vote green if you can vote for an NDP candidate or a liberal candidate who has a much better chance of winning your riding? I think that they have to follow the example of some of the provincial parties that have been pretty successful. Um, you know, those in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island and, um, one of the things that they've done is that they focus much more on just being a serious party, a good opposition, a not overly partisan. I think that is where the sweet spot is for the Greens. And what happened with Annamie Paul and the party, now I, I'm not going to you know, get into whether it was her fault or the party's fault. I think everybody was uh, to blame for, for that. But um, the fact that they seemed like a bickering kind of nasty internal party was so off brand for a party that was supposed to be seen as like a nonpartisan, let's be nice kind of party. I think that's what really hurt them. If they can get a leader who sees, seems serious, seems like, uh, you know, they're not overly ideological, that could be a way forward. But I don't know, it's going to be tough for them. And it might need to wait until people are turned off by both the Liberals and the New Democrats and need another option. That's when the Greens might be able to uh, to make some make some gains again. Now, the last uh, Green leadership race, you had big names, Glenn Murray, Annamie Paul. You had Courtney Howard up in Northwest Territories. You had David Murner, a uh, former a Liberal. This election, I, I know of two that are going to announce that their intention is to run, aren't a well-known figure right now, is that going to be, is that going to hurt the Greens? Because for a party that's sort of in shambles right now, do you not need a, a another Elizabeth May to come in and sort of pick up the pieces and move the uh, party forward without having to introduce themselves to the electorate, but also the Green Party members? It would be helpful if they had someone who was better known, because even Annamie Paul uh, was a relative unknown outside of, um, you know, Green Party politics. And even then, I'm not sure how well known she was inside the party. Uh, like a big figure that had national recognition, that would be amazing for the Greens, because suddenly everyone would be like, oh, wait, this party does matter. Like, the, the party has got his act together. And, and uh, if this person's getting involved in, wow, maybe something's really going well. But if, if it is just a, a series of names that people don't really know outside of Green Party circles, then they have to go through the entire process again of, of introducing their leader and getting them known and giving people a reason to pay attention. Because for the media, um, it's hard to give a lot of time to a party that 
you know, has two seats in the House now, um, doesn't really have much of a role. And if you have a unknown as a leader, it's going to be hard to sell. Let's hear what let's 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 you know listen to what this person has to say. So it is going to be a challenge for them. And and it's a bit of a, a vicious circle because since the party's not doing that well, it's harder to attract better candidates, which means it'll be hard for the party to do well in the future. Um, so yeah, they need something to they need some good news. Uh, so maybe they can get some from the Ontario election or something like that. But it's been a it's been a rough little while for the Greens. Does someone like Mike Schreiner think about potentially throwing his name in the hat because he's well liked, or even a David Coons out in New Brunswick, uh, or I forget his. I, uh, I'm going to pronounce. I don't remember who the leader of the official opposition in PEI is, and that says Peter something. Bevan Baker. Look, B- Baker. <laughs> I apologize. As we just said, no one really knows who opposition leaders are. Um, do do someone does someone like them look at the leadership and say, okay, I have had an election under my belt. Let's let's move federally because I think I can do what I did here in Ontario to or New Brunswick or PEI or even out in BC to a national stage. I think that those leaders have put so much time. There's a lot. They've been there for a long time. Kuhn has been there for a long time. Bevan Baker has been there for a long time. Um, Schreiner has been there for a long time. They seem so anchored in their provincial party and the success of the party is so tied to them that I wonder if they would consider jo- making the jump to federal, which might be much higher risk, and end up setting their party back. Uh, it goes a bit against their own messaging, which is very much about you know, being there for the province, being there for, for their constituents. Um, so for someone like Mike Schreiner, I would think that he would probably want at least another term you know, having been the MPP for two full terms, then maybe he can jump to federal. Um, but I don't know if he's interested in it. And um, you know, after sure enemy Paul, who who would be right? Yeah, well, that's it. That's the problem. Do you really want to take over this party right now when the last time it didn't go well for the leader and they didn't get a lot of support from within the party? Are you going to get support from within the party? Do you know the party apparatus enough? I don't know. It's, it's a big risk going from the leader of a party having a seat to not having a seat in a party that's in more or less in shambles. The last leadership race I want to talk about here is the one that is uh, coming up on May 14th, and that's the Maverick Party here in Western Canada. I'm not sure how much uh, knowledge out east uh, they're getting, but they seem to be the Western Party, and they want to emulate what the Bloc of Equa does with Western Canada. Uh, we have two candidates, uh, Tariq uh, Anelga and Colin Carrick, uh, both who are have been on the show as of airing this. Um, the Conservatives have done traditionally strong out here in Western Canada. We saw the Mavericks under Jay Hill uh, run in the last election in 32 ridings. They did not do as well as they want it but they've planned to run as many candidates as they can in the next election. Does the, do the Conservative Party have to worry about this new kind of upstart separatist party? Uh, that, while they don't want to call themselves separatists, I should, I should correct that. This new Western Bloc Party. No, I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, to all respect, all respect to the candidates who came on your show, uh, I thought that they were going to have a bigger role in the last election. And to me, they did so poorly that it does make me think that this party is not going to have much of a role um, going forward. We'll see what happens. But, you know, like the Buffalo Party in Saskatchewan, the Wild Rose Independence Party in Alberta, you know, they've they've at least, well, the Wild Rose Independence Party, we'll see how they do in, in the upcoming provincial election. But the Buffalo Party did well in some ridings. Uh, but the Maverick Party really didn't. And I think that for them, if someone like Pierre Poliev becomes leader of the Conservatives, then I don't think they have a path forward. I don't see, because Poliev is going to be exactly what Western Conservatives want. If it is someone like Jean Charest, though, or Patrick Brown, then maybe, then maybe there's a chance to emulate the success of the Reform Party and start the whole process over again from 1990, uh, 1988, 1993. But I think right now, as it stands, uh, the party doesn't hasn't really shown that it's it's needed from Western conservatives because the conservative party as it currently stands is very anchored in Western Canada. Um, and so I think that for a lot of people who might wish for more, uh, you know, West wants in kind of thing, 
that I think that the conservative MPs they have in Alberta and Saskatchewan are primarily doing that job currently. And just to play devil's advocate, because they've both come on the show and I know exactly what they'll say once they hear this episode is, well, they've, they, the Conservative Party MPs of Western Canada haven't done anything for Western Canada. So that's there. That's me pitching the Maverick line here for five seconds. Um, last area I want to talk about, and I want to do this quickly because I, I, I know we're running out of time here, is while uh, Ontario election is uh, coming up here in a, four weeks, in four months' time, we are going to the polls in Quebec. Francois Legault's uh, CAQ is a powerhouse in Quebec right now. They just took a riding from the Parti Québécois uh, that I believe has never gone anything but Parti Québécois for a long time. Um, is he unstoppable? Is he kind of the new René Levesque of Quebec politics? <laughs> Well, he might be the, the new uh, Maurice Duplessis uh, of uh, Quebec politics, if you can pull it off. It's much more in that style, I would say. But um, he right now, he looks pretty hard to beat. Uh, the polls have been very strong for the CAQ. Uh, his approval ratings are quite high. And his opposition is not very strong. And it's extremely divided. Um, because right now, there's four parties, depending on the poll, uh, that is somewhere between 10 and 20% support. And you have the Liberals, who have... a decent support and it's gone down but they still have a lot of support among anglophones but they're doing very poorly among francophones you have the parti quebecois that is seemingly falling out of relevance quebec silly there is too far left to really be too much of an opponent to the CQ. and then you have the conservatives who've come started to rise and they have some decent support in some parts of the province but if they can win three seats in the CQ, that would be a pretty big breakthrough for them so i think for the CQ. Um, you know, the, this is the first term government for them. They seem to have tapped into where Francophone nationalist vote is. They're getting that vote away from the liberals, the old federalist vote. They've gotten the sovereignist vote that is not that keen on sovereignty anymore. And they, they seem to be in a very strong position, at least for the next election. I won't say they will, they'll be in power for decades, but at least for the next one, they're the ones to be. In the last federal election, uh, Legault endorsed Aaron, well, semi endorsed Aaron O'Toole and his uh, conservative party. Uh, Justin Trudeau seems to be, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau seems to be uh, buddy buddy with Legault. Uh, does this stick around until after the election and then they can get play hardball with each other, wait till the next election? Because uh, Trudeau doesn't want to ruffle any feathers because that's where he needs to break through to win his coveted majority. How does how do the federal party leaders have to approach Legault over the next few months? And if he does win a larger majority, which it looks like he could, uh, in the next term of the Quebec legislature? I think the relationship's always very transactional. And I think everybody's very um, pretty transparent about that. Uh, when they're getting along, Trudeau and Legault get along very well. When they don't, uh, then it's it seems like it's a problem. But, you know, he did more or less endorse O'Toole. He also sort of endorsed Blanchet. So it was a it was a it was a non-endorsement endorsement, but it didn't seem to help. It didn't seem to do much. So it, it did in a way show the limits that Francois Legault is very popular among um Quebecers, uh, particularly Francophone Quebecers, but they don't really want to follow what he says in terms of how to vote. Because I think that one of the things the CQ has done pretty successfully is be a somewhat non-ideological party. And so when you're saying that you should vote for this or that party, I think it kind of undermines that message a little bit. But um, I think that it continues to be this kind of transactional relationship. And when you cross Legault, you can, if you're going against Quebec jurisdiction, then you can cross Blanchette and he can be pretty effective too. So you do have to be pretty delicate in how you balance that. But again, the rest of the country doesn't always like it very much when it's seen that the federal government is pandering to Quebec. So you do have to balance that out. And it's not a, it's not an easy thing to do for any leader. I've got to ask the, the joking question here. Alex Terrell, Green Party leader. <laughs> Where's he go after this election? Because it seems like I didn't, he's been on the show. He's probably a nice guy. He's gotten to some hot waters over the last few weeks over his stance on Ukraine and the Russian uh, war. Um, do the, is the Green Party dead in Quebec after his little hiccup that he had a few weeks ago? <laughs> uh, the Green Party has been struggling for a little while in Quebec, and I don't see that changing. Uh, they've had some internal issues, and uh, Tyrell has uh, 
there's been elements of the party that wanted him to leave and he didn't. So I assume that means he'll stick around for as long as he wants. But there was a time when the Greens were starting to peel away some Anglophone vote. And there was a time when um, they had a leader named Scott McKay. They seem to be doing pretty OK um, and maybe had a future, but they haven't really been anywhere for the last couple of elections. And to me, they seem like one of those parties that um, they get they get a bit of a non none of the above vote vote. But I don't know. I mean, all of the parties are not all of the parties, but if you got Quebec Solidaire, the Parti Québécois, the Liberals are pretty environmentalist now. CQ for a center right party is more environmentalist than you see elsewhere. <laughs> Again, it goes back to where we're talking about the federal greens. Not a lot of space there. So we, uh, my last question for you is this: What are you looking for for the next uh, four weeks before our next episode, which we bring on another pundit? What are you looking for in Canadian politics, federal, provincial, municipal? What are you looking at? Well, I guess by the time in we're talking four weeks, we might have uh, at least two of the conservative leadership debates will have come and gone. And so what I'll be really, to me, that'll, that's the most interesting thing beyond the Ontario election, which won't uh, be finished for a little bit beyond that. But um, we've seen lots of barbs now between Poiliev and Charest and between Poiliev and Brown. Uh, what happens when they're face to face? And uh, how nice are they to each other? How not <laughs> nice are they? And who are they nice to? Because they do want to get those second choice ballots. So for me, that'll be a really interesting and revealing moment, those debates that we're going to have in May. One of those debates is happening here in the province of Alberta in Edmonton on May 11th. And I will be watching that May 18th leadership review vote here in the province of Alberta. With I forgot about that. Yeah, Jason, Kenny, let's see if he survives this, if he gets his 50% plus one. And May is going to be, and then the election. So May is going to be a fun time if you're a political watcher. Um, before we go, uh, where can people find you? How can people subscribe to The Writ? They can go to the writ.ca. You can subscribe. You can get some free articles. There's some paid uh, for paid subscribers. There's some exclusive things. You can go to the YouTube channel. I've got the videos uh, up there and the writ podcast. People can find that as well. And uh, that's, of course, free for everybody. And for anyone who's listened to the show before, you know what I'm about to say. The links to all of Eric's uh, information is the website, YouTube, uh, and all that will be in the show notes. Highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's $6.99 a month, if I'm not mistaken, $74 per year. Highly recommend that you subscribe to his uh, letter. Uh, he has great information, but he also likes to talk about past election results and past elections, which is my favorite part about it. So highly recommend that you do that. Eric, thank you so much for your spending the last hour with me and uh thank you so much thanks for having me it was a lot of fun so with that my name is christopher brown have yourself an excellent day guys and remember get out from behind social media for at least five minutes and go have a conversation with somebody because it actually does make our society and democracy a much better when we talk to each other face to face instead of through 240 characters talk to you later guys